Hello. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay has gone from strength to strength since its fourth edition was released in 2018 by Cubicle 7. There is a complex path that must be walked when honouring the legacy of a game as strong as Woofrup, whilst also creating something that is accessible and engaging for modern audiences in the modern gaming market. And that is the challenge that my guests today are responsible for facing into. I'm joined once again by CEO of Cubicle 7, who returns to talk to me about the continued development of the Woofrup range and the exploration of the boundaries of the Warhammer world. And this time, he's not come alone, because the producer of the Woofrup range is also here to talk about some of the supplements that have been released, where things will go next, and just a glimpse of the old world. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Dominic McDowell and Podrig Murphy. Thank you both for joining me today. I, I thought we'd start by just a little bit of an intro into yourselves and how you got into gaming and then how that brought you into the gaming industry. Excellent. Um, shall I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Dom McDowell and I uh, run Cubicle 7. I got into gaming through game books. Initially, Fighting Fantasy Lone Wolf was huge for me. And then I found my cousin, uh, Simon, who was painting some skeletons uh, downstairs when we went to visit. And that was it. I think I never looked back. So explained they came from a, a shop called Games Workshop. I went and bought Talisman and soon was back for Blood Bowl and all, all flavours of Warhammer, including Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. So, uh, and that was it for me. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, it was, I went to a boarding school and we were desperate for things to do that weren't sports, uh, basically. <laughs> um, and a friend of mine got me into Warmer 40k and then we got into fantasy and we got into fantasy role play in Mornheim. And we had a little small, tiny room at the back of the uh, theatre and we, we played games there Excellent. and uh, sort of never looked back from that, really. I, I remember going to college and thinking like, oh, that's all behind me now because they probably don't do stuff like this in college. And then I got there and it was a gaming society and it was it all, it got even worse. <laughs> so um, I never really looked back from that. And, I, you know, I've dabbled in a lot of things, but role playing is really my passion. I, I, it's a little bit transcendent to me. So mm. that's, yeah, that's it. So it, it's been a blast and to get into the industry uh, and to work with Dom a little bit. I, I'd written for some gaming conventions in Ireland, written scenarios and helped start a gaming convention in Galway back in the day. Um, which is a great thing to do if you then want them to accept your written scenarios. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, then I did a small supplement and uh, yeah, just sort of chanced my arm really and applied and yeah, I was lucky enough to be taken on back in 2019. So uh, yeah, and it's, it's been a well ride ever since <laughs> yes. professionally and just in the world. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny, the university gaming thing though, isn't it? I think that's, um, did, did you know I was president of the Little Goblins Banana Republic? Yeah, you mentioned it before. It's a great, <laughs> yeah. Which was Plymouth uh, University's Games Club uh, for a while. <laughs> so um, that's <laughs> yeah, that's a republic was, that was officially recognised by the Queen. Officially, it right, was indeed, yeah. indeed. Until until we crashed the minibus into the centre of Bristol. Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was <laughs> massive diplomatic incident. Yeah, yeah. I wasn't even there, and I had to be appalled in front of the the university student union committee to explain why a minibus was wrapped around Bristol. But uh, everyone have... was fine. Everyone was fine. So it's all good. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> well, was this the result of role playing? Did it just get out of hand? Or was it, it, did. Just... it did. It did. <laughs> it was um, a a LARP group returning from. I can't even remember which LARP. But I think they were all quite sleep deprived, which probably didn't help. And the reports I had were that there was like a little gathering after the impact and they uh, they put together an away party that were sent into Bristol to gather supplies while everybody else stayed with the down shuttle crab minibus. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it's. It was, I think yeah. it was very silly. I think that's probably the best way. To, <laughs> the best way to do it. Everyone was okay. No one was in a red shirt. Everyone. No, no, they were all great. good. They were all good. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Budrick, you, you became the producer for the Warhammer Fantasy roleplay line when you joined in, in 2019 at Cubicle 7, right? So what, yeah. what does that role entail? What, what are you sort of responsible for in that position? Well, it, it entails quite a lot and it's grown um, and sort of evolved as well. So I came on just around the time of um, the Enemy in Shadows companion. Um, so that was the, the companion to part one of the Enemy Within. Um, so what we had at the time was, you know, this long legacy of what we're before, uh, was following on from, from previous editions of War Fantasy Roleplay. And we were working on the Enemy Within, which was, I mean, a literal dream come true. Um, at the time, a lot of pinching myself. Uh, and then we got into it. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's a broad category. It involves working with an awful lot of writers um, to, you know, put things together. It involves working very closely with Dom and with, with Games Workshop to kind of both get that vision for the line that you wanted. And then also to talk to Games Workshop about like where they were on the, the you know, what, what they saw as the bits they loved about it as well. Um, and and that's been a very collaborative relationship with them, which has been great. Mm. Um, and has sort of continued to serve us as we went into other things like Imperial Maledictum and so yeah. on as well. So that's been very exciting. And, you know, looking forward to the old world too. But we'll touch on that later, maybe. <laughs> yeah. um, it's so, a very broad role, though, isn't it? There's a lot it it is, yeah, because there's a little bit of sort of working with stakeholders. There's a, a, a certain amount of just planning. There's been a, a chunk of just writing um, on things as well. And then working very closely with artists, um, you know, commissioning art, working on that feedback, making sure it reflects the sort of visual identity of these really beloved worlds. Um, and then just making sure it's delivered on time and on budget, which is, mm. you know, and, and I'm sure there's people sniggering in the audience being like, oh. um, but, you know, it's all a balancing act. And many things have been delivered to one of those two criteria, <laughs> uh, which varies by projects. Um, but it, it's been a blast and it's been great to work on so many things. And then I think moving moving forward, I've sort of spread to working a little bit on other lines. And mm. we've had um, Dave Allen working an awful lot on uh, Warmer Fantasy Roleplay products directly. So there's some things that I'm more hands-on with and some things that I'm less hands-on with now. So it, it's been hugely interesting. And it's, yeah. you know, it's been five years just about, and, and there's something incredibly memorable and exciting about probably every project, but at least every year um, that yeah. I've worked on. So that's been, that's been great. I mean, to, I don't know if this is a good analogy, but it almost sounds like in sort of Hollywood terms, there's, there's the producer element of the job but then is it right to say there's also a bit of a director a bit of a writer as well and, and sort of pulling it yeah, together that way i think a little bit um you, you know, know you have more than cameos i'd say yeah yeah it's not <laughs> more than cameos i think i'm probably cameos at the moment <laughs> no it's very do a lot. as well i mean i am was very the I, you know very close to we worked. We worked together very closely on that. I mean, yeah. there was, there was a, several trips out to different hotels. So we just literally like, hold ourselves up. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we've ascended to the ivory tower. No one talked to us. <laughs> we'll just work on this thing for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, it's probably something like that. But sometimes you are just the grip as well. It's just like, well, this PDF is is borked. What do we do about it? And it needs to move. So, <laughs> so it, 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 it's it's been a very broad category. But I think we've Cubicle Seven has sort of grown. Mm. alongside that so there, there's yeah. people here now who are better at those individual things than i would be and can do them while i focus on other areas so mm. it, it, it it's been a blast i mean it's still it's still very hands-on and probably always will be but yeah it's, it's an interesting role yeah <laughs> yeah i mean that what you mentioned there about sort of almost breaking the back of imperium maledictum where you so you literally just had to sit down with a blank piece of paper i guess and and pull is it, it together is what's the process like for that yeah, so that would th oh, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, it was an interesting one. Um, it, it wouldn't have been a blank sheet of, there was a point where the paper was blank. Um, but I, I would say, I said to someone recently that we probably made and, and iterated on that game more than anything I've worked on. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there was, there was a, the, the heady days of the blank paper were long behind us <laughs> by the time, you know, uh, where, where you're, you're working on brass tacks and you're going back and forth and you've looked at like, well, what works and what doesn't work? What, what is Warhammer 40k and what, what isn't? What isn't feeling right? Um, you know, what is the Macarian sector? Like, and what yeah. story do we want to tell there? What is this game? And, and you, you can, that evolved and then a vision, we really got a vision for it. And then we started to interrogate all of the systems in the game and and we're, we're looking at well, like well does that reflect what the design goals are here you know maybe it doesn't maybe you know if this is in place where your characters are very punchy and I, that went from things like you know how bad's a critical hit can you can you use something like armor deflection which before has 
to avoid, you know, to, to, to break, a, a, to get out of a critical, or can you literally just accept it or spend fate? You know, and then it ended up being a point where it's like, well, turning a sword blade and surviving it seems somewhat reasonable by, you know, sacrificing a bit of armor, taking plasma cannons to the face and being like, oh, my helmet got burned off. I'm OK. <laughs> doesn't, you know, narrative is, narratively doesn't carry yeah. um, for the types of game we wanted to tell, which were, you know, investigative games where planning was essential, role play was essential and getting one up on your enemies before you ever faced them in battle was essential. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't do that, it could end so quickly and violently yeah um, we, uh, and that's part of what 40k is i think like I, yeah you're not a space marine and i am you're you're someone far far beneath them who's heard rumors of them and uh yeah so that was interesting but yeah i mean that, that was literally we were just there rewriting things we had an awful lot of um leviathan uh stuff in front of us and and earlier editions and things and just being like well how do we discuss Ligers? how do we discuss this and yeah so it, it was a blast and really big up to the um, licensing department of Games Workshop and very dedicated mm -hmm. members there who helped us uh, through that. And, you know, we're, we're really on call and read, you know, so much text from us. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I applaud their, their patience <laughs> in all things. Yeah. And the two-day playtest. I don't know if I say too much. But, no, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, um, the one that never ended. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was, um, yeah, it's great. Again, you're just working with a with a, with a partner where... Oh, no, the one all the games were so yeah, different yeah. when I was... No, there was a different two gate. Yeah. Yes, there was just me sleep deprived rolling dice to see how it felt. <laughs> you can do the math, but until you roll the dice, it's not real. No, yeah, we had a great, uh, that was great Auburn Games workshop. Yeah, yeah. Memorable moments. And I love when they got their hands on some bulgers, the, yeah. the team over there, and their their eyes lit up as they splattered cultists <laughs> all over a manufacturer. Like, yes, <laughs> these bulgers feel like how we write about bulgers. Yeah. Yeah. So, you don't get to run games for um, license stores very often in <laughs> licensing yeah. stuff. So uh, that was really good as part of the, uh, yeah. Yeah, but they are all big gamers oh, over massive. there. Yeah, yeah, they're, well, actually, yeah. yeah, they're already running unreleased stuff, some of them. Yeah, they <laughs> absolutely <laughs> abusing their position. But uh, <laughs> quite all right. <laughs> we, we applaud it. Yeah, I'm guessing that must be quite intimidating because there's no one, I'm guessing, who knows the world even better than you will. And you're trying to get them to sort of to feel like they are in the world that, that they've helped create, right? With the game, and that's yeah. the, whole, the purpose of it. So, I mean, cause in a sort of general balance perspective, when it comes to design, how do you find that sweet spot between sort of a mechanical, the kind of crunch of something, but then the feeling and what you want to evoke in the mind of the player? I mean, I imagine that's a difficult spectrum to sort of to navigate sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, you have to sit down and, and play games and, and not just the game you're working on, play games, engage with the core hobby, you know, assemble miniatures. Mm -hmm. um, I have an awful lot of ungors to base code right now. <laughs> you, you need to engage with that. Yeah, no reason. No reason. No reason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, it's the kid Bretonians. That's why. <laughs> you, you, you need to um, sit down. You need to roll dice. I was sort of half joking a moment ago. I was like, well, it's rolling dice because statistics only to laugh the story, but they do only to laugh the story. You've got to sit down, roll some dice and make sure am I having moments where I recognize like a really good role and a really bad role at a glance? You know, do, do I do I feel like I've got some equipment, I've got a few nice talents. Do I now feel like cool compared to what I was before? Um, if, you know, something is charging at me and I've got minis or I don't, it's all theater of the mind. You know, do I feel like, oh, I'm in a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. This could go terribly. You know, are you evoking the, the, the right feeling? I mean, that's, yeah, that's yeah. my two cents anyway. I think, yeah, with us, it, it does come back to theme um, and, and our objective of what we want people to have as their experience. We take that from lots of different places. That'll be our, our take on a setting, for example, but also what people seem to feel about it. You know, we'll, we'll to look at the received wisdom and uh, how, how that impacts, um, yeah, what we want to do. The... The other thing then is the experience of the table, and I think that's what you were referring to there. Yes, the what we what a games company or tabletop role playing company is for is helping people have an incredible time at their table. It's you know, we we can have the cleverest ideas in the world, but if it's not going to translate to fun when you get your friends around the table for a game, we may as well not have bothered. But they may as well have written their own scenario. Um, and yeah, but role players are not yeah. short of inventiveness and imagination. Time, that's another thing. <laughs> but, yes, yeah. uh, um, and you know, that, that's where our role comes in on a basic level is that prepared material that people don't have time to develop themselves. Where I think we can elevate it is when we are really focused on what's going to make every session 
as good as it can be, you know, whether that's through GM advice, whether that's through how we structure an adventure, whether that's the thought that we put into NPCs and uh, events and those set pieces and, and environments and the storyline itself. But the we 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 do our best work when we've got that that focus on okay, this is gonna be so cool. Um the uh, starter set, Wathrop Adventure, I think is a good example of that. So T.S. Lucart, who's a longtime writer on, on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, and I really spent quite a lot of time on that initial adventure, especially sort of the opening scene um, and then how that extended out. So I don't, I don't want to give too many spoilers away, but we just tried to put in a load of laughs at the start because I think that nothing really gets a role-playing game off up and running than you know the, those those laughs are, I, it's just different to anything else i think the maybe some comedy mm. you can get that kind of like belly laughs but the the something about the shared experience of having created that together is really important i think to the um, the the experience that we get from from role playing when it's at its best uh, and that's then moving into an adventure that you're kind of invested in because of how good it's gone so far and how much you're enjoying it. And then we put you in the hands of uh, Rudy, Klump and Klug. And, you know, well, the rest just writes itself, doesn't it? So, <laughs> um, so that, again, was very conscious uh, design, trying to make a game easily, well, the most easily go in, in the way that we, we wanted it to, um, mm. and to make it easy for game masters to to do that, to, to deliver that experience. It's something that Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay always seems to have had, is that sense of humour, right? I guess it runs through the Warhammer Fantasy universe generally, mm. but as much as there's grim and perilous and darkness, there's always been jokes and puns and kind of silly names and all that sort of fun stuff as well. I mean, yeah. I, I, even to these days where you're, you're new products that you're releasing now still have that sort of kind of punny vibe to some of the names the latest orc release is the is tribes and tribulations which is really fun so there's that kind of stuff i mean are you conscious of making sure that you keep that sort of sense of humor alive as well yeah yeah absolutely i think you've got to be careful with it because i think if you go too far it stops working to a certain degree so yeah. I think having the balance is important but but definitely I, I think like in in life there's we as humans bring humor to you know most situations <laughs> that we often massively inappropriately in my case it's <laughs> but um it, it varies from like being a bonding thing to laugh at someone to a survival instinct to like things that you can't you know you need to yeah. laugh or you'd cry and I, I think it, part of what the purpose it serves in, in, in a grim and perilous setting like the old world is the laughter, uh, those little moments of light that mm. are sort of cast in the midst of it all. So, you know, to, to give you that break from the, the doom and the gloom. So it's a break for the players, but it's a break for the characters too. Because I think if you just sit there going, describing how miserable things are for three hours and then things got worse and then things got worse. If you don't have that moment, you know, outside the castle wall, sitting around the fire, laughing about like you know what your dead friend used to do in in the pub and like the the stuff that halfling got away with before the you know things finally got up with him you, you sort of need to have those moments to counterpoint it or it's just like sort of misery for no reason um you know yeah. it, you have to have that promise that it could end yeah and that yeah. adds to the, the fun and sometimes the tragedy of it as well <laughs> while guarding against it go running into fast i think yes yeah, yeah 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 there's some things that yeah you can look back on and be like a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's it's interesting, I think, humor in games generally as well, because it's quite hard to guarantee that delivery. I think the it is difficult. I, I, with the the humorous games that are sort of set out to do that, paranoia and tune and floating vagabond, they were quite hit or miss actually at the table in most of the games that I was involved with. Often, I think uh, paranoia probably landed the most reliably mm. but it's it's hard isn't it it is hard so mm. that's something that we we try and keep an eye on as well that it might yeah. not might just something might just be our sense of humor or it might not translate or, or what have you so yeah it's, but it, yeah and it goes back to designing the game and the story mm. you can't actually design you can't design an experience you can design for an experience um, so I think with with the jokes of the memorable characters and the, the moments of like peril and tragedy, you're sort of setting up an awful lot of dominoes in the knowledge that like at the game table, not all of them are ever going to be knocked over in one campaign. 
you know, they just won't land for some people. So you try to put in enough that like, you know, there's something interesting on every page yeah. for the GM. There's something that's going to be like a memorable moment, mm-hmm. hopefully in every session. And, um, you know, even if two or three of them, it don't happen because I mean, you know, you don't need to tell GMs like, Hey, your players might not go as you expect. Like they know that um, <laughs> the rails come off and suddenly they're, you know, halfway to none before they remember the stories in camper bad. <laughs> and you, you know, you, so you need an awful lot of things there. Um, which is something that was worked into the companions a lot mm. for the enemy within, which is like a ton of scenarios. Yes. But also just NPCs um, with, with hooks back to the plot or yeah. with, with interesting stories that are own to tell. So that there's a toolkit there. So you've designed for a good experience and then mm. GMs can pick up those those things and, and sort of benefit from the work we've done to fill in fill in the gaps and make sure everyone has a good time themselves included. Mm. Yeah, and the enemy within, obviously that's a huge experience or potential experience. Mm. There's loads yeah. of different elements to it. There's that clear, you know, a strong driving narrative through the whole campaign, but then you've got all of these different sort of rabbit warrens you can go down. I mean, what, what was the sort of, progression for you as you continue to develop that out so you joined just after the first part had come out and yeah then so yeah how did you sort of how, what was it like taking the reins of that from a, a sort of production perspective and sort of making sure that it it fulfilled the rest of the brief immensely intimidating <laughs> hugely and, and i was supported and everything anyway but i mean i can i'm someone who can worry no matter what's there but it, it was an intimidating um experience but i mean the thing that helped it was running play tests a, you know, a couple of books ahead of where we were. And um, that was the, the something that was really crucial um, and, and helps to kind of be like, well, this is what, what people are reacting to. And um, there was also this huge wealth of, you know, material from the earlier editions that we were calling upon, um, which was really, really helpful um, and useful. And then, I mean, there was, there were bits of it where we were sort of digging in on specific topics and looking at like, well, what's, what are the players doing in this part? So death on the right, they're up and down the right quite a bit. They're on the barge. Do, do what tools do they need to help there? And what tools do the GMs need as well? So we had the trading rules um, in there, but like a critique that it existed, um, you know, for, for a long time about the campaign was like, well, players can get sort of obsessed with the idea of making money as merchants. Um, <laughs> which on the one hand is like, it's cast as a problem, but actually they're having a good time. So it's okay that they're doing that. Um, but the support that was needed there uh, that we sort of identified was, well, you need a lot of people to pull them back onto the plot. So if you look through, in, if the companion has a, a ton of NPCs, who are, oh, this person's got an interesting thing going on. Here's what they think about the world. And here's their weird connection to a certain place on the river that <laughs> might drive the plot forward. You, yeah. you know, so it's to try and pull people back in there. Um, but I mean, as we went on... And all, if all else fails, there's always James Wallace with a suspicious number of lanterns. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just, yeah, if they seem to be enjoying something too much, don't be afraid to burn it to the ground. <laughs> but um, yeah, and I mean, then, like, Power Behind the Throne was amazing to work on. Um, you know, there was... Graham had done a lot of the sort of groundwork of reorganizing that, you know, and how it should look, which is brilliant. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that that was a, that there was some uh, reassurance to be had in having Graham there. hundred percent. Yeah. You know, hundred percent. Yeah. You know, so that, I mean, that was, that was great because that, that's such a great tale and a great look setting. Um, and I, you know, I don't even want to talk about it too much because spoilers, but mm-hmm. a lot of what was done was like GM facing. So things are reorganized. We looked at calendars of, of events that will be happening in game and, tried to put all that in the most logical way possible because it's a bit intimidating to run. Um, but there's a great arc to the enemy within, I think, which is like, you know, the part one, uh, Enemy in Shadows, is is relatively linear with some exploration at certain points. Death on the right lets you, takes the rails off a little bit, you can explore, but you're probably going to stick to this riverway so we can talk about what's on it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not like you can wander literally anywhere. Uh, and then by part three, Power Behind the Throne, which, I mean, Stan is my favourite part, is very much a sandbox. Here's a city. Here's a problem. Good luck. <laughs> you know, there's there's events happening. There's stuff going on. There's calendars that are progressing without your interference. So, you know, enjoy that. And I, yeah, I mean, that was that was a lot of fun to work on. Um, and then from there, I suppose we were getting our feet under us as well. Dave had come on, was giving you know a huge assistance and everything else. Um, uh, and that's when we looked to the Horned Rat, which is part four. And you know, there had been this vision there for it um, before. Um, but that was something that broke away from the enemy within as it had been written. Um, because something wrong with Kislev, which I spotted just on a table inside today, is mm-hmm. a great story. It was the former part four. Um, but it takes you very much out of the Empire and sort sort of serves, you know, it, it's a cool story with some really memorable parts mm-hmm. to it and really lovely, like the, the gospel turns great to explore Kislev. I still love the spirits. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're so they're, cool. They're, I came across those, they're one of my early Wafrop experiences. 
And yeah, they're, they're still with. I can still remember the quotes for the the spirits. That's yeah, crazy, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so it's brilliant. I mean, his love is a place begging for supplements. But the um, the at that point we were creating something that was you know very much our own and keeping the adventure focused on the empire and the sort of the things that were happening to. I mean, the horned rider. I think people can infer who the protagonists or antagonists might be there. But the, um, you know, you're looking at the things that are gnawing away at the empire without necessarily having to leave it, but it still serves as a sort of like, mm. you you go into this and you come out and you look around and you're like, oh my God, everything's getting worse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we, we may have averted this thing, but this thing's still bubbling away. Um, so it, it was interesting and we probably got more ambitious as we went along a little mm. bit as well. And, I, you know, I, I think it, it, it stands as a really good, I hope, iteration of one of the best campaigns ever written for role-playing game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, touch wood, people are enjoying it, and we'll continue to enjoy it for many years. And, yeah. and by all reports, they are. Yes, yeah, it's, it's one of the, the uh, one of the things that would always sort of like be a, a huge part of the end within for us. It, for me, anyways, is the internal play test was the I said the best game that I played. It it was just fantastic. And uh, so crack, yeah. yeah, we immortalized the characters in the credits, so we did uh, uh, very self <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the heroes of the hammer. Was, yeah, yeah, they're in there. But, you know, you can get away with the odd bit of stuff. I think so. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> the um, I mean, with that that's really interesting. The way you sort of frame that in terms of the, I guess you know the rails coming off as you progress through the campaign and you get to the sort of sandboxy sort of space. Would it be fair to say that the sort of Cubicle Sevens Wolf Rup journey has been a little bit like that as well so you've you've sort of started with producing or sort of reproducing things that existed and looking at the legacy and kind of doing that and then increasingly looking outside the legacy and tackling new things and expanding and sort of exploring uh, sort of fresh territory does that is that a fair thing to say yeah, I think that. I think that's yeah, yeah. that's yeah. And very succinctly, we, we should get you to, to do some. Could you write that out down? <laughs> um, it feels like it would be good to put up something. Um, I think so, and I mean, I suppose that's reflected in in recent. Um, you know, because we've been going places that the previous editions didn't mm. didn't get to. Um, Lustria is an obvious example. Uh, yeah. Of that, and I mean, that was amazing to explore. Um, you know, a new a new continent and a new place and present. Be, you know, and make it, it. I think as I was saying earlier, it's like it's got to be inhospitable to characters, but hospitable to gamers in the sense that <laughs> it needs to be a place you can have these interesting adventures um, that are very divorced from the sort of setting of the old world and particularly the empire that you're used to. And um, so to go there and to explore it and to you know encounter totally totally alien um, you know entities effectively in, in form like the lizardmen and the slan in, mm. in the slan and it's just. It's very interesting, and even places like Skeggy, which are feel more like somewhere on the Sea of Claws rather than mm. than you know any. Uh, it's it, yeah, hugely interesting to work on, and there was very deep. There was a deep, you know, well of lore to draw on, and um, but at the same time, it was like presenting it as a role playing game. Um, mm. But you know, supplement was it was a, a new challenge. So that's been fun, mm. and we're looking forward to going some other places as well. And um, you know, we'll, Ultuan in some capacity quite soon, and. Uh, yeah, screw that quite soon from your memory, viewers. Uh, <laughs> when we get there, we get there. Um, <laughs> see the previous well, comment. So, uh, certain values. Yeah, certain, certain values soon. The, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so, dwarves. And, yeah, dwarves, dwarves quite a bit yeah. as well. And the dwarves are an interesting one because some of that is very much mm-hmm. homage to what's gone before and some of it is quite new. So that'll be interesting to see how it lands. Yeah, and, and, and I, I'm excited to see people engage with it. Yeah. Um, and then some things that we just wanted, wanted to remain in that, like, because we are old you know, old, yeah, probably, but fans of the old material. Um, so doing something like going to Marienburg and, and you know, updating that, but working with, with you know, existing, you know, writers who, Anthony Reagan, who worked on the original um, Marienburg, Salt of the River stuff, you know, just updating that for, for fourth edition uh, and adding a bit of Cubicle 7 mm. spice and magic to it and, you know, and, and pulling on a lot of really talented writers um, and artists to bring that to life is probably in that mold of, you know, old material as a homage, but mm. in a new and accessible way. And, um, you know, so it's not that we've abandoned that path either, but yeah, we mm. are excited to do your stuff and have been enjoying it. Yeah, and that, that goes back to what you are saying earlier, I think, Jordan, about the, what the process is for us, uh, how we how we make things. And it's quite interesting, I think, the, the difference sometimes between how we'll approach different subjects and different 
different types of book. Yeah. Uh, generally, we've got our, our plan of you know what, what we want to achieve in the next 12, 18 months. Uh, it goes longer than that, but that's more sort of sketched out. But we we start to really put the meat on the bones for, for those yeah. things and then go through a, a, a creative briefing stage here, really, which is where we decide you know, exactly what's going into each each book, what we're going to cover, what we're not going to cover. And then that moves into um, expanded synop- uh, synopsis. The, uh, sorry, my, I'm just post COVID, so I'm um, <laughs> yeah, recovering slightly. So if I go off on a weird tangent, then please do it. Um, the uh, but we, we 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 develop it. I think quite uh, to that detailed synopsis kind of level, yeah. and then start sort of bringing in freelancers and mm. uh, and working there. So there's a there's a quite a lot of that kind of strategy and tactics kind of stuff that goes on. Um, centrally on, on on those kind of things and then it depends on you know say we've got uh, somebody who's a real expert on a particular subject then there may be sort of like we're more sort of handing that over to them to, to develop yeah. quite a long way uh, before we'll get back involved as well after that initial kind of briefing whereas other things we tend to be more hands-on with and we'll maybe mm-hmm. work with freelancers on smaller sections that we'll then piece together and make sure that it all flows yes so yeah, and it's interesting. It varies quite a bit by the style of book mm. as well. I think in terms of how they're planned and, and so on. So you know, it's neat. yeah, yeah, it's an interesting thing to make your career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, yeah I'll, I'll bet. Yeah, I mean, the Lustria <laughs> ones are really interesting. One you mentioned the sort of the the deep well of history that that's there because because that was something that was uh, on the cards for first edition. But never yeah. made it out, and and Richard Halliwell was working on that. Obviously, he he'd explored Lustria quite a lot in various scenarios for Fantasy Battle. It sort of turned up here and there in different ways. Were you able to sort of bring some of that history and legacy into the Lustria book, or with a you know, is that something that you was just like let's start fresh, or as much as we can with later uh, versions of Lustria from Fantasy? I think it all oh, went into the hopper, didn't it? It did, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's yeah. because there's some of the skeggy material is from a a, a a white dwarf that I was afraid to handle, you know, such <laughs> was its age, and uh, you know, um, the yeah, so yeah, it all it, it really did all go into the hopper, um, and and you know, a lot of very talented people worked very hard to create like quite a coherent vision out of that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, there and Lustria was ever sort of there was always a vision for Lustre, I think, from the mm. early days. Um, but something, you know, that 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 clear, very clear role playing game, something sort of vision out of it. Um, so yeah, I mean it, it, part of the joy of working on something like Warhammer Fantasy uh, is that there is this very deep well of lore and and you know much beloved to draw upon. Um, you know, and, and to be able to put in those little touches and, and references back and, and to mm. pick up something that, that you know people love and is well known or maybe that four people have ever you know written into the lore of their personal army you know that was mentioned yeah. once in white dwarf it's cool to pick up those things and be like oh that's actually intriguing where does that go mm. yeah. so yeah no and, and we are you know we're, we're, we're really lucky to be with a great team of freelance writers who whose names will be familiar to uh to people going going back um away and yeah i'm terrified of listing in case i miss yeah, somebody out a, that is <laughs> ever the thing it's never an attempt to, to be like oh forget those people it's like oh, if we say them but not this oh, yeah. oh God. gosh but, so do have a look at the credits pages all those people are heroes yes that's the, Absolutely. That's the reality yeah yeah i mean on the the sort of flip side i suppose given that warhammer you know it has got a long history it w- was originally created in the 80s and there's a lot of stuff in there that's been drawn from real world cultures, and it's not mm-hmm. always done. You know, there's been some ele- some things that have been perhaps a little bit insensitive in the past or problematic. We might consider now. I mean, do you sort of tackle that in a given way now? Sort of, what's what's the approach to modernizing some of that stuff? Well, I, yeah, I mean, there can be challenges there, but we're very lucky to be working with Games Workshop um, because they've made it very clear that Warhammer is for everyone um and and that's the sort of a value that we hold as well yeah, and as a, it's a yeah. very core cubicle seven value that we want our games to be enjoyed by as you know as many people as want to enjoy them yeah and we want people to be able to see themselves in in the characters that we present and to be able to make characters that you know reflect who who they want to be or who they want to see struggle through you know a grim and perilous world um so we, i mean that's the value that we try and bring to it mm-hmm. and you, you can you can apply that lens to material 
and sort of look at it and be like, well, this is cool and has a really pure heart of joy to it. And you can bring that forward. And there's other bits that, you know, don't don't work with the Warhammer today. Um, and, and you just you keep an eye out and you apply common sense and you, you try and think yeah, about, about think the fans that's... and and making sure that people can pick this up and have a great time, mm-hmm. uh, whether they first started playing it in 1986 or whether they just found it on the shelf today and maybe haven't even played a role. Yeah. yeah. Yes, being alert to it, I think, isn't it? And, and yeah. 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 Try, try and yeah. be sensitive and, and apply that, you know, a, a good hearted sort of kindness to how you bring things forward mm. and try and reserve your cruelty for player characters. Yeah. <laughs> it's not uh, players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's something isn't there about the like the essence of ideas as well, isn't there? That that um, yeah, yeah. So the, the, but I think you probably just said that then. But um, the, be, or be, be, being, <laughs> able, being able to to look into you know what what's at the essence of this property, what what is it about it that people love uh, that you know, we've got our own insights into, and we we, we try to you know, keep, keep talking to people and finding out what it is that they they really love about it, and that's the important thing to bring through. You know, the, the rest of it, how 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 a particular thing might have been communicated at any particular time, that just changes. That you know, uh, and not just on on um, on on the, those like, kind of grounds, but you know, just terms of expression and the way people talk and your know, things change all the time. So it's yeah, having that focus on what's really important. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I suppose. Uh... Obviously, there's there's sort of updating the material and updating the storytelling and sort of how you're approaching games. You've also sort of updated uh, distribution as well, and if uh, if that's a segue that makes any sense. But I was just curious about because you've also done like direct download stuff with like one off one shots and sort of smaller stories and stuff like that. How do you decide whether or not a new adventure is going to be like, well, let's do it as a little one shot, let's release it as a PDF versus let's bundle them all together and put it into like a an archive um, book? What's the sort of approach with that? Is that is it just you take a look at the material on a case by case basis? Sometimes I, I think my, my my overarching criteria for it is that something that's a rule or a a, system, a way yeah a way of doing things or you know, something that you'd want to be permanent permanently part of the game is definitely something that we should be doing in hard copy uh, because people should be able to collect that stuff in a book but if there is a, a an example or your ex- a, an example of a group or um, an expression of those rules i've got really vague haven't i um, so a particular mm. pirate, but if, if the pirate rules should be in a book, a particular pirate band and adventures around them can be in a digital only release. Right. So the, yeah, so that, that's the broad principles. And then, yeah. and then on a case by case basis, like sometimes we think when, when we're in the early stages of a game, uh, like Imperium Maledict, I mean, I'm like, well, for, back in, in the uh, few years ago, I wanted to be able to get adventure content out quicker than having to put it through a full publishing cycle. So some of those adventures were put out as as, as small PDFs. And some of some of the the content, some of the like uh, the the buildings of the right land and um, those sort of things also were just like little bits and pieces that that we could uh, get out there um, for people to 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 get to grips with. And and it's yeah you know, it's, it's it's a quicker mm. way of getting some content out so uh and not everything is going to make it into a book as well there's a limited number of Books, projects yeah. that we're going to put Just... through uh in any one given year so it's a nice way of filling out little bits and pieces then with the with the pandemic it got even worse trying to get things printed the all the lead time stretched out it was quite horrendous so we had more of a mix during that period as well of of the digital only yeah um, things now we did find that a lot of people were uh or wanted us to to print some of that uh, early material that was digital only which we are in the process of doing now um that yeah, right, right. yeah right so we uh we we collated some of the earlier pdfs uh especially the ones that the people have really been asking for in hard copy and we made that uh, available as a book uh that will be landing Couple of yeah, so I think, I think so. Don't, don't, don't quote us on this. No, but yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> we've approved printed hard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it should yeah. be somewhere. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, that that that. I think Dom's given a good summary of the of how our thinking goes. Mm. Um, I think the future. I think that's that's something that that's worth saying. We will have more digital only products in the future. Mm. We've we've seen a huge increase in. Um, 
all of the costs associated with printing. So you know, the, 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 the raw materials, the shipping, yeah. you know, that's all gone you know, quite, um, yeah, well, it's ludicrously compared to how it was yeah. before. So I think that we are going to see a balance between what, what's that core material, the core material of something that will go into the book mm. and what doesn't need to be in a book. I think we will see that changing. And I'd imagine industry-wide, I, I think... Um, I cut, that can't just be us, I would imagine. So, uh, yeah, no, I mean, the, and it, it comes up where we're talking about rising costs. The problems mm-hmm. that are pointed to are usually global and no one's, you know, everyone's susceptible yeah. to that. Um, so, because you've got to send all your boats the long way around Africa uh, so they don't get shot at as they're going up to the, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. The things spoils. like that. So, yeah. Luckily, we role playing games to escape to from. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we're always looking at ways of making it, um, yeah, better, you know, make, make, uh, alternative ways of doing it. Yes. So how can we maybe split print jobs so that we can get it made in different parts of the world and, and avoid some of those issues? But there's always pluses and minuses. So, yeah, yeah. It, it gets a bit mm-hmm. tricky, but... Uh, yeah, there's no magic word. Yeah, no, not at all. But, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's yeah, <laughs> those are the type of things that we also think about, uh, <laughs> but they probably aren't exactly as interesting <laughs> as... <laughs> yeah, for, for, that's you. Quite- there's a sort of spirit of almost the old white dwarf releases and articles yeah. then being collected into like an apocrypha now or, or you know sort of a, putting it all together yeah. into a book there's a, there's a, it's a kind of a through line there as well if you if you yeah. that comparison well, yeah we were quite fond of those and it's where the archives series archives of the empire yeah. came from was that we, right. we liked uh magazine you could, you could basically you could pick something <laughs> up and be like well i've got like weird bit about Potion Square in Marienburg and like I've got a weird war band of goblins and I've got this thing here mm. and they're all very different um, and maybe wouldn't have warranted a full a full book mm. you know from the get-go um, and it, it's fun to pop them in and, and, and have them available as articles so uh, yeah and I think some of that in PDF then as well and, yeah you know, that's yeah and you never know where it goes if something's really popular maybe we come back and do a book <laughs> as we did with Tribes and Tribulations which started as the Flustery Tribe uh, PDF and you know, people really like the format and it worked well for us mm-hmm. as well. Uh, and became a whole book of mm-hmm. wacky orcs and goblins and <laughs> ogres Which for you to deal with. It's available now. Like so that's out digitally first, isn't it? There's, and then yeah. there's a sort of lead yeah. time until that physically is released. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So we we, we six months, I think we were it's about six months. Yeah, yeah. And it can be can it sometimes has stretched longer for one problem or another. Yeah. Um the yeah, so we do make things available. If you pre order from us, you'll get a PDF. Um I, very rarely ever broken that um you know when we were trying to bundle things together for shipping or something but yeah i don't think we want to do that again so if you pre-order something at the pdf straight away and we make that clear so you can engage with it while you wait for your your hardcover to arrive yeah right yeah and you mentioned so you sort of alluded to uh also might be a book or a, somewhere we might visit at some point in the future is there anything else on the sort of cards for for wolf Rup specifically coming in the in the sort of future that you can talk about oh i mean there's there's loads happening um and this is something that like because we 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 talked about the kind of can i bring this in the old world side a little um, bit yeah sure yeah, i was just so, gonna start saying two two elf two elf books yeah exactly so <laughs> two, two, <laughs> yeah, we're doing something for the old world and I, I i felt you know in the press release i thought it was clear enough where it's like woof will continue as ever it's beloved forever but immediately you know even friends from uh <laughs> And the guy who it is knows who I'm talking about was like, why are you killing my books? <laughs> you know, and it's we're, we're absolutely not. What for uh, four continues? We love it. There's there's miles of road set for it. So mm-hmm. there's a, a pair of elf books and a pair of dwarf books in mm-hmm. in in process right now um, that are, are shaping up really well or our manuscript complete in some cases. Um, and those are both really, really interesting to look at. There's a very detailed plan. Um, for Marienburg and some things kicked off there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then beyond that, I'm not saying this because I get people's hopes up and they're like, oh, it's not there. But there's plans out for years, <laughs> guys. <laughs> you know, years and years. Yeah. Years and years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they will, you know, they will have to pry this yeah. game from my cold, dead hands <laughs> you know, before it's killed. <laughs> World War 4 has is, is done really, really well for us. And yeah. we, we're conscious, you know, also that it'll be getting up, it'll be 40 years old, mm-hmm. more fancy role play. In a couple of years, um, yeah. you know, so we're we're thinking at least that far ahead. Uh, so yeah, plenty of things in, way in the road. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm way more. I know, but okay. oh, there's no yeah. point in talking about twenty, you know, twenty seven now. Like I said, <laughs> although it's coming faster every year. 
the yeah, yeah the, the next couple of things up should be uh the a, a pair of dwarf books and a pair of elf books that we're very excited about um and we want to kind of give a really tight treatment to the for player characters so like here's everything you need to know about being a dwarf all the different careers here's how to you know be uh, do rune magic and what's it like to be a dwarf what's it like to be from here you know extra eye color tables in case people really want those and so on um, and then a sort of an exploration like a you know give give gems a lot of tools for telling very dwarf focused mm -hmm. adventures um, and then do do the same thing for high elves which would be I, I think also really really important and, and mm -hmm. wanting to give them a really close treatment because we, we've touched a little bit on um, wood elves in Ark of the Empire 1 and gave some extra options and, and looked at them which isn't to say we won't return in more detail down the line um, but it, it's a lot of fun to look at um, Ultuan as an adventuring location um, uh, in the same way that we looked at Lustria um, but probably not continent wide because I think it's a continent with a lot of different you know island mm, kingdoms and so on yeah so yeah. We, 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 we want to give each the the, the the attention it deserves yeah exactly so outline of broadly what it's like really detailed look at somewhere in particular in the same way that we, we didn't start by going here's the empire we started by saying here's the Reichland and especially here's Uber's Reich um, it'll be fun to do the same thing for dwarves and elves and, and, and deep dive and you know I, I think both books should support people if they want to do a fully high elf uh, sort of game um, or a fully dwarf game here here you go and you can feel like you made just as meaningful diverse choices about who your characters are you are not a dwarf you're this person from this clan who's done this with this history mm -hmm. and tell just as interesting a story as if they were a, you know a bunch of um, humans from the Reichland uh, or all over the empire or whatever it would be so yeah, we're looking forward to that and plans continue. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot we want to do with the line. Uh, so it carries on. Don't, don't panic. We're not. <laughs> I mean, that that sounds amazing though. So like, yeah, because I quite like the idea of an entire high elf party. And it's, would it almost be like Lustria? There is enough material here to, to put a campaign together for just set in like the elven lands or just within the dwarf kingdoms and and that sort of thing is, is that the kind of thinking sort of going in that's what it sounds like and that's how yeah, we, that's what yeah. we'd like to do um yeah. you know, and, and that's not to say like you can't be humans and, and there's mm -hmm. reasons given for why like there might be ambassadors and the like allowed like, to work hard to justify why there's a dwarf in old one though if you ask me <laughs> but um, <laughs> the, i'm sure it could be done by inventive gms and we would try and support you there but uh yeah it, it, it's to give that experience and be like yeah this is a very different place it has its own mm -hmm. challenges huge challenges that nobody now even thinks about yeah. um and and, and you know, look at that and explore that and uh, see what that's like. And and it'd be, it would be a different game and a different type of buffer up while still remaining essentially warmer. Yeah. So, yeah, excited for it. And it, we were very excited for it before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and excited for other things too. Yeah. But also for it Sure, yeah. Nice. I mean, and, and it sounds really exciting. So that, that's great to hear that it's, yeah, loads of stuff on the way. And it's, it's yeah, some cool stuff from the sounds of things. But is the other stuff that you also mentioned there in parallel that we're also going to be seeing yeah. at some point is the old world itself in terms of the old world, the new version of Warhammer, so set hundreds of years before traditional Warhammer fantasy roleplay. That's something that you announced relatively recently. Can you talk about that at all? What's going to happen with this old world RPG? I mean, it's early days, yeah. so there's... Um, I mean, generally, the we don't want to go too far... In what we say, because we might change minds. Yeah, um, I think we talk a bit about the questions we're asking ourselves about what this is, and, that, and that a little bit good. about the high level vision for it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So, yeah, what have you been thinking about? Yeah, yeah. oh no, this. Uh, <laughs> so, I, th I think the from where we are at the moment, I, I think um, there's a there's a few factors that go into uh, approaching the old world. Some of them are sort of in game, and some of them are out of game. Yeah. Um, so the from the out of game stuff. We are we're aware that generally speaking, with role playing games, um, the general the average level of complexity is is getting lower. I think that that there's um, certainly an appetite for easily accessible games uh, that you can play. Yeah, just you know, just less complicated games. And I think that it's really important when you're looking at something like a, a setting uh, th that you have a couple of different entry points for it. To give the best, uh, I suppose the best boosters if you're role playing, you're role playing in that setting. So if yeah. you're role playing in the old world of all eras, uh, it's really important for us to bring as many people in as we can. Uh, so you know, the more games there are, then the more chances people are to find people to play with. 
and uh, the they can sometimes be a little intimidating for a new player, maybe with less experience. If there's a big, thick rule book, and you know, maybe some people are really familiar with it, but it's quite a learning curve. So we do what we can in the starter set. So that teaches you how to play step by step, you know, through yeah. an adventure and all the rest of it. But there's some complexity you can't away, get away from in, in, in a game like uh, what Black Warfare 4. So I think it's important for us to use the old world uh, or the opportunity that it gives us to to have a yeah a, a, an easier way in, really. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. And I think the time pressure thing is, is very true as well, because whether it's like lots of games that exist, you know, there's, yeah. there's it's, it's a great time to be a gamer and, and to be into the hobby. There's so many um, ways of engaging with it. Uh, but also then you can realize things like kids, you know, that has put pressure on your time. So having a game that's like highly accessible and is ready to, you know, get you into interesting old world experiences mm. as quickly as possible. You know, there is some benefit to that. Uh, well, at the same time, you know, we love a big, long, juicy line with tons of stuff. You know, I think that's what Wolf Rip is. Um, the, you know, you have this incredibly deep dives. I think with the old world, we have the opportunity to do something that's like a lot more accessible from the get go. And then to sort of like keep pace to some degree with, you know, how the plot evolves um, mm -hmm. from, from Games Workshop themselves and to tell stories that are sort of like engaging with that, you know, with the major, with, with, with the beats of that and so on. Um, so I think that's going to be, you know, like interesting for people as well. Um, you know, so th yeah, those are some of the real world things. I, mm -hmm. I think there's also an in-game thing where yeah. I do expect people or hope and, and pray really that people will come to this fresh who maybe haven't engaged warm fancy role playing, don't know what it is, but they've picked up the old world because it's amazing. Um, and we were all at the launch and really enjoyed it, Jordan. It was great to, <laughs> to see you there. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, 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 those people are going to come to this um, as a hobby and not necessarily know who Carl Franz was or what the end times are about. Mm -hmm. They know what they're, you know, the stories and tales are reading about in in the old world, in the Black Library books that are coming out and, mm -hmm. you know, in the the uh, materials from, from the studio directly. Um, so we want a game that's like, hey, you, you know your stuff. This is the game that lets you, instead of telling the stories of the grand armies, tell the stories of the individuals, you know, that, that are involved in those fights or left in the wake of those mm -hmm. fights, whose lives yeah. are, you know, overturned by these grand narrative strokes. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. We've had a lot of mm. thoughts about it. it. It'll be a different system to to Wolf Rip, but one that's sort of like mechanically adjacent. So mm. I, if you're coming from Wolf Rip Four, you should be able to see where the nuts and bolts are, and you know how your character would would be in either system to some degree. Mm. Um, but you know, so that that I think will be interesting. But overall, it should be a little easier to grab some friends together, roll some dice, and you know, get bludgeoned to death by Nongor. Yeah. So that's a pretty sure aspect of it. Yeah. So now an yeah. experience you can have in, in any period. Yeah, exactly. Or to great. gloriously rise above it all and succeed. That's that's a possibility. <laughs> but you know, the potential to be beaten to death by a fairly forgettable well, yeah. on the tabletop war game would be a forgettable sort of <laughs> creature or, or enemy, you know, mm -hmm. makes the moments of glory have meaning, I think, as well. So yeah. So no, I think if, if we can pull that off, and I, I think that the that, that yeah. I, the ideal that we have at the moment is that it'll be rec the, 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 all the numbers will be recognizable enough, and the characteristics and the skills will map, mm. so that if you really wanted to uh, to to play an old world adventure with with the up rules, minimal yeah. messing should be required if 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 for, for, for people who really just really want to stick with 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 Waffle up as well so that's the the idea like i said we're early days so we'll we'll see how realistic that is we can revisit this video <laughs> <laughs> in a year's time <laughs> 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 um so that's exactly the sort of statement i was trying to avoid saying no yeah um, and you're I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> hostages to fortune yeah i believe they're called um uh, yeah, that that's the uh, um, yeah the overall right objective is just trying to share old world role playing with 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 as many gamers as possible um, and maybe some new gamers. Yes, um, exactly. so I think it's such a you know well you know it's a setting that we love so much and that there's so much in there that uh, yeah we just want to, to get as many people coming in and giving it a go as possible. Yeah, absolutely, and it sounds yeah exciting. Uh, and uh, as you say, it's going to develop over time. So I'm very eager to see where it goes. Yeah, but you yeah. did very, mention very early days. You know, sure, 
yeah, it shouldn't be as different as you know. It won't be years away, but it's still early days. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing I was just going to pick up on, Dom, as well, was you mentioned the sort of the industry as it stands today and how that's changed, and there's a bit more of a push for, I guess simpler or more accessible systems generally i mean what's your sort of view on that what what, what are you seeing across the the rpg market nowadays um so i think there's lots of strongly thematic experiences kind of that people are going for so i, I think there's there's a lot of um, games that people will probably play a handful of sessions of that uh yeah are just really strongly themed and I, I think that's great. And it's something, that obviously, that the indie RPG community has been doing for, for decades at this point. And it's, yeah, it's great. You, know, you can probably find an RPG on pretty much any subject out yeah. there, I think. <laughs> so I think definitely some of that's uh, come to broader. Uh, yeah, I always sort of shy away from saying mainstream in relation to gaming because it's not quite as simple as that, is it? But uh um, there's definitely a bigger audience for for some of those really smaller targeted games. Mm. Uh, so that that's definitely something that we're seeing more and more of. Um, I think that the we're seeing less of the kind of traditional RPG line um, that that we've been developing <laughs> uh, for for, for Wolfrop and uh, uh, Wrath and Glory and Soulbound and Imperium Maledictum. So uh, I think that there's still there's still a place for those things. But uh, the it's gauging it right, really, isn't it? You know what, what yeah. can be those sort of like those those more self contained experiences, and you know maybe maybe we've got some some opportunities to do some things like that as well. You know, if there's something that's a very strongly thematic take on something within one of the Warhammer uh, settings, then maybe you know that that that's something that we we could be doing as well. So yeah. the um, yeah, so that that's 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 the first thing I think that the making things as accessible for people as possible definitely is is something that that is but just has to be a focus i think you know, that the there there is that uh, that that appetite for the less complex more get into playing it uh, quickly kind of games there's also still a huge appetite for the level of complexity and detail that's more in the traditional mold so absolutely we want to be continuing to make those games as well i mean not just for us <laughs> but yeah. Um, not, uh yeah so I, I guess it's like a balance you know that, maybe that's where your informs our approach to things of, of trying to provide both options um and and uh, give yeah give, give people the, the chance to play that i'm just gonna sit down and it used to be called beer and pretzels games didn't they i don't know if that's still a thing or if that's very, very Dragon Magazine circa 1984. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, the uh, and then you come down to us knowing what we intend a game to be and yeah. what we're what we're aiming for with it, mm. and then keeping that priority straight and uh, yeah, trying to reflect what we're trying to do in, yeah. in in what we are doing. I think it's 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 often a mistake to try and you know, be all things to all people. So just having a really conscious approach to what we're trying to achieve yeah exactly and, and i guess not being afraid to you know make it uh, uh, something else uh, yeah while still maintaining the other thing as well you know it's not yeah you don't have to pivot an entire uh world to a certain way of doing things no, no. Say, here's a cool story yeah and then here's the tools to tell that story it'll be a good time uh even if it's a short time so, yeah absolutely yeah. yeah i think that's always the way isn't it with with trends and and um, Pause for the fire yeah. engine there. Yeah. Sorry about that. By. <laughs> um, it, it's it's that appropriate reaction to those trends and emerging mm. things, isn't it? Because there's um, you, you there, there's many different parts of any well, I mean, any industry really, isn't it? But you know, any any kind of hobby as well. There's um, yeah, there, there, there's lots of people who are into lots of different things in lots of different ways. So uh, yeah. Yeah, and especially today, the hobby has just gotten so broad in in terms of what's available. You know, that it's hard to keep abreast of all the changes and and, and everything that's available and like what the hot new thing is. Um, but it, it also means that if, if you want to engage with a lot of different games, it, it can be easier if they're a bit more mm-hmm. compact. I think too is one thing. But then at the same time, you know, it's not. It, is it really a game if you didn't spend 18 months on it? Like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> went through three characters and have stories to tell for the next 20 years. <laughs> you know, both experiences are intensely valuable. And, and yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> to be a bit, in a way I'll cringe at myself later on a little bit transcendent just <laughs> yeah well, absolutely I, that, that, it's always what I've said to people who, who don't necessarily who haven't played role playing games is that everybody should try and play a role playing game and it, it, they're not for everybody but the people that they are for they're really they're for really for and they'll give you an experience you just can't get any other way you know it, it's uh, yeah yeah they're, they're so special <laughs> I mean, I agree completely. So, I guess one final question, just about the 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 work that you've done over the last um, well five six years on on Wolf Robot. Is there a particular product within the the line with within Wolf Robot Four that you're most proud of, or that you've most enjoyed working for uh, working on, or is that an unfair question? You know, is it, they're, they're all they're all your babies, so it's hard to pick one. I'm guessing, but. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely a bit of that, but I think things always stand out. Though. There will be always yeah. standouts, yeah. Um, I mean, for me, uh, in term, yeah, the enemy within was a. I don't think it's hard to take any part of it in isolation. Power behind the throne is probably my my favorite part of it. I really think that's mm. you know, if you could only run one part of it, find a way to run that one. We do give some tips in the in the companions, great. Mm. Um, probably my favorite product is probably the Imperial Zoo. Oh. Um, you know, which isn't associated to anybody else, but that yeah. one was great to work on. Um, you know, T.S. Lucar was really instrumental to it. We 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 kept a fairly small roster of of writers, which was T.S. and I uh, on that one. Mm. Um, you know, Dave really helped out with the art commissioning, and uh, there was only about you know we we used a lot of art from Monsters Arcanum as we explored things, and and had a fairly limited list of you know artists and um. That we worked on, I don't know. It was a very tight project in some ways, and there's a very clear voice to it, and it, it mm. does. You know, God, we could have done a standard beast area, and we probably could have fit more things in if we just done that. But I think if you take the creatures of Warhammer on their own and just give some rules to them, you 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 risk this. It, it's not a game about diving into a dungeon, and exploring, and seeing what's in the next room. It's a game where like everything should have a lot of character, and the way people see and experience sort of beasts that inhabit the world. It, you know varies an awful lot and they tell these stories about them and they don't fully understand them and you know they're they're larger than life in a lot of ways that you know it, it, it's just a special sort of experience and i really love working on that book because it's a very special okay. book and the way we were starting it was because uh, ts also wrote the uh, second edition old world bestiary which is very well regarded as well so that he was really keen on something doing something different you yeah. know, not just sort of going back to, to that formula so uh, yeah, down, you could say I think really he, wanted to <laughs> he had he certainly had strong views. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, TS is a uh, um, member of staff here as well, so uh, so we're allowed to talk about. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Yes. Um, um, but yeah, yeah I think it's. I mean, the the feedback that we had on that was amazing as well. I think my most memorable one was the um, oh, it's somebody said. The feedback was, you bastards, a, an RPG beastery is not supposed to make people cry. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is a Good. wonderful compliment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, so no, there's a great, there's a great narrative running yeah. through it, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a yeah. really good one. That's that's my own. But yeah. So, yeah, what's yours? Do you have one? Um, well, I've already mentioned the yeah, edit. I think on the, the Star Set Adventure with TS. So that was. Uh, that 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 was definitely um, a good yeah that, that was good fun definitely um, I think the I love writing the little intros to things I like the the the, up, um, the journey from the uh, the borders of the empire through mm. to the the, the the heart of the city into the inn uh, that that was that was really nice to be writing that that one felt really yeah. Was the opening page of the core the, rule book. Yeah, yeah. So no, I really I really enjoyed that. Um and um actually yeah, the the, the Imperium Maledictum one as well. Um yeah. so I think I did the first draft of that. We again with TS, I think it was on that one so. Yeah. Um just work with TS Lucar if you can. I think that's that, that seems to be the Yeah, no, that's been really good. I mean the play test we've already mentioned for the enemy within, um, that that was yeah, just one of those really Amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah one of those one of those special gaming moments. So, uh, yeah, that was really cool. So, yeah, that was a lot, a lot of fun. Ooh, but, um, yeah, that's been good. Um, there is so much though. There's um, there's something just really 
really satisfying about working on on uh, on Waffra. Um Just like so much of it has been 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 really good. Um, the uh, one of the highlights of all the um, the awards. They've been good. Um, we've won some awards for oh, yes, yeah. yeah. They, they, they were they were nice moments um, for the the rule book, and um, I mean, mine's gone blank. What was yes. that? Cheers. I was, I was silver any for the production values on on the enemy within that was editions, which was very nice. That was good. Yeah, yeah. very nice. It was yeah. It was a privilege to receive that, but on behalf of an awful lot of people. Yeah, um, but yeah, that was a lot. Of, that, was, <laughs> that was nice for me. Good professional highlight. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's really good. Um, what else was the yeah, Salzman? I think that that was that was really nice to be um, uh, you're exploring new parts of the empire as well. That 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 was really cool. Yeah, city guide, but to a new to a city that hadn't really been touched before at all. So that was yeah, that was also great. And, yeah, you know, there was a lot of people in that one too. And I, or yeah, that was another one that was there was a lot of people on, but it was very focused. Um, you know, uh, yeah, the, the someone had a very particular view for that. And I've forgotten their pen name, so I, I can't even mention them. But God, read the credits, please. Don't rely on us. There's so many great people. A list of heroes. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, yeah, I think the top of it all for me is just, yeah, working on Warhammer. It's just yeah. fantastic. Warhammer broadly, it's yeah. just, a, a, yeah, one of the most <laughs> interesting um, the sort of universes and universes plural yeah, in the world to work on. So it's just yep. amazing. A privilege. Yeah. Well, I think you've done terrific work. So thank you for all thank of that. You. Thank and, you. you know, thank you for joining me and having a chat with me. I will be, I'm going to be keeping an eye on my watch as I as I wait on Marion Berg's final release at some point, because that's <laughs> something I'm super excited about. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's been terrific to, to chat. So thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Jordan. Thanks, thanks for having us. us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Pleasure. I want to give mammoth thanks to Dom and Podrick for joining me to talk about their experiences developing the Wolfrup line and talking a little bit about where things are going next. It sounds super exciting, and I cannot wait to see both the Wolfrup and the Old World RPGs as they develop over the next few years. If you would like to support the work I do here on the channel, then feel free to check out my Patreon, my Ko-fi, and my Discord. And you can also use my Element Games affiliate links, all of which you will find down below, and all really help support the channel. Thank you once again to Dom and Podrick for joining me. Thank you for watching. I'm Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs>